everyone to today's webinar on expanding the school health research network into primary schools. I'm Kelly Morgan, a research fellow based at Decipher Cardiff University, and I'll be presenting the first of two presentations today on key findings from the student health and wellbeing survey. The School Health Research Network, otherwise known as SHERN, has developed an engaged model of research across Wales with schools as partners. And this currently includes all mainstream secondary schools in Wales. And it provides a regular snapshot of health behaviours among 11 to 16 year olds using a student and school level survey every two years. And as part of this, there's feedback mechanisms with both individualised school level reports, local authority reports and the national report shown in an example here. However, a sole focus on adolescence is too late for many young people, as we know that health behaviours track across the life course and our earlier work has showed that a substantial number of young people have significant emotional difficulties by the time that they finish primary school. So gathering data on younger age groups could offer an opportunity for joined up working across childhood and adolescence and also an avenue to better understand and support events such as transition to secondary school. So in August 2020, the Welsh Government funded the development of a model for expanding the existing shown to primary schools and to evaluate a number of key feasibility related issues. So as part of this work, um, the development included work with education and health stakeholders, school staff and pupils, which we'll share with you in the second presentation today. And what I'm going to share with you now is findings relating to our national survey of year six pupils, which included local authority booster samples to enable the reporting of pupil wellbeing data at school, local authority and national levels. To provide a brief overview of our research design, this has been split into distinct phases. So first of all, we developed a bilingual 36 question online survey and questions were informed by a review of our secondary school surveys, looking at what might be suitable for asking primary children and making questions simpler where possible. We also undertook stakeholder feedback, a consultation with our young persons group Alpha and a wider review of any questions being asked in UK based primary school surveys. And a key part of this was to compare our data gathered from primary age children and secondary age children, and also to include some questions from a survey we administered in 2019 as part of a separate study, so that we also have comparisons pre and during the pandemic. Each school was provided with a research protocol and teachers oversaw the completion of the surveys within the classroom setting between April and July 2021. And this was postponed from the previous term due to the impact of COVID and school closures. In total, 224 schools were invited to take part. 73 of these had taken part in a similar survey that I mentioned in 2019, and that also included one replacement school. And 150 further schools were invited from four case study local authorities, and these were stratified by the percentage of pupils eligible for free school meals. There were three layers to our consent process. First of all, schools signed an agreement to participate. 
Next, parents were given the opportunity to opt their child out of the survey. And third, children who were willing to participate in the survey were asked to provide assent. In total, 118 schools initially agreed to take part in the survey. But following school closure delays and the rise of the Delta variant, some did not complete the survey within the allotted time. And our final sample comprised 76 schools taking part. Five of these completed the paper version survey. And that equates to a 34% participation rate out of the total number of invited schools. Fewer than 1% of parents opted their child out. And a total of 1,863 year six pupils completed the survey. And we had around an 80% pupil level response rate with 14 pupils declining to participate. So in terms of sharing our main findings, we've produced a national report which is split into the following nine sections. But for the purposes of today and time, I'll be presenting key insights into the first five areas shown here. So for COVID-19 worries, children were asked about a range of issues during the pandemic and whether they experienced them never, sometimes, most of the time, and all of the time. And what we can see here is that 67% of children reported feeling worried about going back to school at least some of the time. And for each question that we looked at, within the report, we've provided a breakdown across subgroups. So for example, looking at reportings by gender and also by family affluence. So as we can see here, children from the least affluent families were more likely to report being worried most or all of the time about going back to school. And we don't see any differences here in reports across genders. In terms of mental health and well-being, so one of the areas children were asked was around emotional difficulties and this was using something called the me and my feelings questionnaire. In terms of interpreting the results, the scores along the bottom of the chart, as you can see, between 0 and 8 here for the scores gathered. And a higher score on this scale reflects higher emotional difficulties. As we can see with the blue bar, girls had a higher average emotional difficulty score compared to boys. So therefore they had greater emotional difficulties. And with the orange bars here, you can see this clear social economic gradient. So we're seeing higher mean scores amongst those from the less affluent families. Another measure around mental health and well-being, and it was looking at the element of behavioural difficulties this time, again using the same questionnaire, but looking at different items. And here along the bottom of the graph, the score ranges between 0 and 4. And again, a higher score reflects behavioural difficulties. So in terms of gender, we're seeing the reverse. So here boys have higher scores compared to girls, so greater behavioural difficulties, but we're seeing that persistent trend with higher mean scores amongst children from less affluent families. And for both of these measures, we also report on clinically significant scores within the reports. So you could have a look at those too. Children were asked a series of questions around their dietary consumption. And as you can see here, just under half of children reported daily fruit consumption and 41% reported eating vegetables at least once a day. If we take a look at the results according to our subgroup analyses, 
We have chart A, which is around daily fruit consumption, and chart B, which is around vegetable consumption. Across both, girls show higher reports of consumption, and we're seeing the same trend for both fruit and vegetables, with those children in the most affluent families showing the highest reports. As a measure of physical activity, children were asked to report how often they exercised in their free time so much that they got out of breath and sweaty. Here we can see that 51% of children reported exercising at least four times or more a week. And looking at the subgroup analyses, we found higher reports amongst boys, so 61% of boys compared to 42% of girls reported exercise four times a week or more. And we're seeing a gradient here across the family affluence groupings with higher reports amongst children from more affluent families. Within the survey, we asked a number of questions to measure school connectedness. So for example, we asked children to report on whether they feel that teachers care about them as a person, with responses ranging from strongly agree to strongly disagree. We found that 90% of children agreed that their teachers cared about them, with slightly higher reports amongst girls compared to boys. And we also asked a question around enjoyment of being together. And 79% of pupils reported that they enjoyed being together. Again, we saw a difference in genders. However, this time higher reports amongst the boys. And there were higher reports amongst pupils from more affluent backgrounds. The survey included an item about bullying. And we found that 28% of children reported feeling bullied by others at least some of the time and responses were more likely among girls and children from least affluent families, the more deprived families. And the final area of results that I wanted to share with you today was around school transition. And we have two questions around this in the survey. So first of all, asking children about feeling worried. We found that half of children felt worried about transition, at least to some extent. And that included 36% of the sample answering quite a bit or very much worried. And the graph here shows that higher reports of worries were among girls and children from a low affluence background. We also asked about looking forward to transition and more than two thirds of children reported that they felt quite a bit or very much looking forward to transitioning into secondary school. Yet we saw less clear patterning between genders and family affluence grouping. As I've mentioned, an earlier study was carried out with primary school children in 2019 and this has allowed a direct comparison of the pre-COVID data to the data set which I've been describing today. We've highlighted some key comparisons here, some of which are promising. So for example, children remaining positive about relationships with teachers and pupils, and most looking forward to transition. However, comparisons are also highlighting increases in reports of emotional difficulties and poorer diet and exercise behaviours. And my key takeaways from today are, even throughout the pandemic, there was an appetite to expand the existing churn into primary schools across Wales. Each participating school and case study local authority has received an individualised report of data and that gives references to national benchmarks also. 
And as I've been kind of hinting towards, all findings are available online via the SHOEM website. And there's a series of key finding slides that you can take a look through. So thank you so much for listening. And we'd like to extend a big thank you to all schools and children for supporting this pilot study and ongoing work. Hello everybody, my name is Gemma Hawkins and following on from Kelly's overview of the findings of the primary school survey, I'm now going to summarise the findings from our interviews and consultations over the last 16 months, as well as our planned next steps for expansion of the School Health Research Network into primary schools. So as Kelly mentioned, we began this work in 2020 and alongside developing and running the survey, we were working closely with education and health stakeholders, including school staff and pupils and people working in education and health within local authorities, the regional consortia, as well as national organisations. And the aims of this work were to develop consensus around the aims of expanding the network into primary settings, as well as the most appropriate model for this, appreciating that it might need to operate a bit differently to how the network currently works within secondary schools. We also wanted to understand how best to involve pupils within the network expansion and um, within our primary school research within the network more generally as well. So this initial work took place between September 2020 and August last year. And it began with consultations with local authority stakeholders to identify four case study areas that represented a variation in terms of North, South, East and West Wales and rurality, urbanity uh, and size and so on. And then within these case study areas, we conducted interviews with school leaders and classroom teachers, uh, including wellbeing leads and um, we also conducted group interviews with pupils from foundation phase and key stage two within those schools. We also interviewed 29 education and health stakeholders from the case study areas working within the local authorities, as well as with regional and national uh, stakeholders as well. In March 2021, we discussed the findings of the interviews up until that point with a wider group of school stakeholders so that perspectives from outside of the case study areas were also feeding into the development work. Um, for example, exploring areas where there had been a lack of consensus from the interviews. And then as Kelly has outlined, we ran a small scale pilot of the health and wellbeing survey with year six pupils in the summer term last year. So I'll just give you a small overview of the findings from all of this work um, in terms of what um, our aims were. So firstly, thinking about the model of the network, um, it was great to hear that all participants were really um, enthusiastic about um, the School Health Research Network to be expanded into the primary sector. Um, as part of this, stakeholders were really keen to emphasise the need to tailor the approach um, for the most vulnerable and not to exclude these groups. And they also emphasised that it's important that within the model of the, the collecting survey data and feeding back this data, that the data is not used to monitor schools or hold them to account. In terms of establishing key priorities for the network, emotional health, mental health, as well as healthy transitions between primary and secondary school emerged as the key initial priorities for the network. In addition, the development of healthy social relationships, with bullying as a focus there and reducing sedentary time and phone use, uh, issues around phone use um, were also all emphasised as key issues of importance. And in particular, which are likely to form key elements of recovery from harms caused by COVID-19 restrictions. The value of a joined up infrastructure to allow comparison of data across primary and secondary schools, for example, and to support data-led action from an early age was emphasised by lots of the participants. Um, stakeholders also highlighted the importance of drawing on existing practice um, and existing networks that bring together primary schools and primary school representatives, for example, the Welsh Network of Healthy School Schemes. 
It was also highlighted that the network should build into and align with existing processes in terms of things like the curriculum reform, um, self-evaluation and schools of learning organisations, so that the network supports these and um, is not a burden. Stakeholders also described a range of models of cluster working, um, including in some areas action planning for health within clusters between primary schools and their destination schools. Challenges were identified, however, for non-hierarchical clusters, so things like Welsh language secondary schools, where in some instances there's a larger number of more geographically dispersed um, primary schools that feed into those secondary schools. Um, so we looked at some you know, issues of where um, data sharing might happen, um, where cluster schools have quite diverse characteristics as well. In terms of pupil voice, um, pupils and stakeholders were keen to emphasise um, the importance of having different options and formats for pupils to feed into the network and um, health and wellbeing research more generally. Um, part of this was about harnessing the existing mechanisms of pupil voice, like um, school councils. But some issues were raised about the issues of representation um, of some existing groups and how other formats and opportunities might also be needed outside of that. Um, one issue that was talked about was um, approaches to membership of these kinds of groups and making sure that open membership um, is emphasised and the use of creative and fun methods. Um, part of what pupils were keen to, to emphasise as well was that um, within sharing and reporting the feedback of, of the survey that pupils have access to that are involved in thinking about what the data means and how it's interpreted for their school. In terms of um, how the survey runs and thinking about how it is developed further going forwards, in terms of when the survey should happen, um, stakeholders told us there's no real ideal time in primary school. Um, some preferred autumn term, others preferred spring term. Um, with regards to uh, the frequency of the survey, participants were divided on whether the survey should be done annually or whether it should be every other year, like it happens currently um, in the secondary schools. And there were quite robust explanations for um, both sides of this argument in terms of how quickly things change in primary schools, so more often is better. Um, but also that time is needed to take action as a result of data, and it might be too resource intensive to do it every year. Some key challenges were also identified about thinking of expanding the survey down to younger age groups. So we did the survey in year six last year, thinking about moving that down into um, year five, year four, and so on. Um, and part of these challenges included understanding what the best approach to parent consent processes are for the survey work, um, how that might be possible to build into existing school practice um, to help, uh, again, reduce administrative burden. There was consensus, however, that we should um, focus survey development in Key Stage 2 to begin with, so this next phase of work to, to look at moving from Year 6 down into Years 5, 4 and 3. And in terms of sharing data and feeding back, um, some um, we talked about the different um, designs of the feedback reports, both for schools and local authorities, um, the potential for more interactive feedback approaches and um, supporting schools to use the data. A number of local authorities had already established um, their own local survey um, approaches and feedback approaches for that. but these local authorities did express a desire to integrate their activity into a larger national infrastructure if um, uh, the primary expansion of Shern was funded on an ongoing basis. So in terms of phase two work where we are now, um, we're working with schools to expand the survey now, as I mentioned, down through key stage two. So this involves exploring the current measures in the survey that we use with year six peoples, how these are understood by younger children um, in order to inform any refinements. And we will also be exploring a rolling survey model that allows primary schools to participate in either autumn or spring term, um, which is a change to the current functioning of the secondary school survey that's informed by the conversations we've had with schools and local and national stakeholders to date. 
And we also hope to do some work with non-mainstream settings around their in involvement in future rounds of the survey um, and network expansion uh, going forwards. So phase two began in September last year and is continuing into the summer this year. So back in September, we did some further stakeholder consultation around these phase two aims. And this then informed uh, what we are currently doing, which is case study work with uh, schools across Wales, um, with uh, school leaders and classroom teachers, pupils and parents to explore refinements to the survey measures, as I um, outlined, also exploring consent processes and the plans for this rolling survey model and continued pupil voice involvement. Following this, we'll be making changes and refinements to the survey and then conducting engagement work with some of the schools we've been working with uh, to inform any further refinements needed so that then we can pilot the refined survey and feed back to schools in the summer term, um, which will then hopefully feed into the next stage of rollout in academic year 2022-2023. But we're still currently um, awaiting funding um, to take this part forward. So just to finish, I'll present the current network model and our proposed plans for future expansion and should funding be confirmed. So the coloured boxes here represent the key elements of the model and how they feed into each other. So first, always beginning with stakeholder consultation to refine survey content with school staff, pupils, parents, policy stakeholders and researchers, as well as school engagement work to ensure that measures are appropriate as we move um, down through school year groups. Following the survey rollout, we then feed back the data to schools. Um, as well as local authorities and provide a national level report and um, we'll also provide um, support for interpreting the data and planning any associated actions including webinars like this as well as research activity and development of research briefings to schools and stakeholders of any key findings. The anticipated outcomes are that there's increased use of this local data within and between schools and at regional and national level so that the longer term impacts of the use of evidence in child health policy planning and evaluation can be realised with the ultimate goal of improving child health and reducing health inequalities. So the plan for this rolling survey model that I mentioned is to work with four nationally representative samples of primary schools across um, a two year period. So conducting the survey four times with four different groups. So when, um, autumn and spring in year one and then autumn and spring in the following year. Um, so schools would just complete the survey once in one of these four groups. But this approach using nationally representative groups of schools would allow for national data sets to be produced twice a year. Um, in order to achieve uh, this plan uh, uh, approach is to continue expanding both vertically, like we have been um, in phase two, down throughout key stage two, as well as horizontally to in, um, work with a larger and larger number of schools each time. So we plan to do this on a biennial basis subject to continued funding. So I'd like to thank you all for your time and also we're keen to hear any feedback you have, as well as to take any questions you'd like to ask. I'd like to give a big thank you to the members of our Shern Primary Expansion sub team that are listed on the screen here and we're on Kelly's screen as well, um, who've all been really integral contributors of this work to date. Um, and just again, to highlight the funders um, of this research as well. Thank you very much.